Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can cover a presentation example of avoidant personality disorder. So a presentation example is when a counselor is working with a client and they want to present that case. So they obtain consent, they remove identifying information, and they produce this case report. The clinical essence remains the same in theory, even though a lot of the information has changed, of course, as I mentioned, to protect the identity of the client. It's used for training, other types of educational purposes, conferences, and sometimes these presentation examples are published. The example I'm using here today was published, so this came from an article, and I'll put the reference to that article in the description for this video. A presentation example can also be called a presentation analysis, a case report, a case analysis, or a case study. So a lot of different names, but they all really mean the same thing. So first I'll cover a little bit about avoidant personality disorder, look at the treatment modality used in this presentation example, and then go through the presentation example. So the disorder we're talking about here, of course, is avoidant personality disorder. This is a cluster C personality disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This is the anxious, fearful cluster. So it's in the same cluster as dependent and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. We see that there are seven symptom criteria for this disorder and that four need to be met in order for a diagnosis. So looking at these seven symptom criteria, we see avoiding work activities that have a lot of interpersonal contact because of fear of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. We see not wanting to get to know people unless they are sure they can be liked. So if somebody doesn't want to get close to somebody else unless they're sure that person is going to like them. Taking things kind of slowly with intimate relationships because of a fear of shame or being ridiculed. In social situations, there's a preoccupation with being criticized or rejected. We see someone who's inhibited in new interpersonal situations because they feel inadequate. We see an individual who views themselves as socially inept, unappealing, or inferior. And the last symptom criterion is they're reluctant to take personal risks because it may be embarrassing. Avoidant personality disorder, also called APD, is similar but not the same thing as social anxiety disorder, called SAD. We know that about two-thirds of people who have APD do not meet the criteria for SAD. So there's not perfect overlap at all between these two disorders. There's a few different conceptualizations here in the research literature about these two disorders. One conceptualization says that only one of the disorders is real, so either SAD or avoidant personality disorder, and usually they would say SAD is real and avoidant is an extreme manifestation of SAD. But in terms of our best evidence, it really does support the idea that these two disorders are distinct, that both should exist and actually do exist in the population. We see that APD is relatively difficult to treat. There is a 31% remission rate after two years. This may seem kind of high, right? Like 31% of people will improve after two years because we think of personality disorders as being stable over time and quite difficult to treat. But two years is a substantial amount of therapy, so you would expect a fair percentage to have remission, at least technically speaking, from the disorder. And what that means is they would no longer meet at least four of the seven criteria. It doesn't mean that somebody's personality has completely changed. Likely, they would still have avoidant personality traits. They just wouldn't necessarily fulfill the full criteria anymore. So when we talk about remission, we have to keep that in mind. Remission isn't the same thing as all the symptoms going away. Now, this particular presentation example does give a little bit of the history, but it really focuses a lot on the treatment side, specifically psychodynamic treatment. Now, psychodynamic treatment, or theory, is really a modern version of psychoanalytic treatment, or theory. And it focuses on ideas like defense mechanisms, early life experiences, the unconscious mind, and attachment. And this is where we really see the emphasis in this particular presentation example, this idea of attachment, specifically of earned security. So earned security is a process where individuals overcome harsh and ineffective parenting experiences. If someone had positive childhood experiences and they developed a secure attachment style, this would be called 
continuous secure attachment. If those experiences were negative, and later on they developed a secure attachment style, like because they went to counseling or something like that, this is called earned security or earned secure attachment. A key part of earned security is this concept of coherence. This is the ability to present a clear and consistent narrative of experiences. And this narrative would need to be linear and logical. So it'd have to have kind of a logical flow to it. So what we see here when we treat individuals with APD, at least much of the time, is their narrative is not logical. It's not linear, it's fragmented, and overall not coherent. So again, the idea here is if we can address these particular aspects of the narrative, that may be one way to treat avoidant personality disorder. Now another way to treat avoidant personality disorder would be working on reflection and mentalization. So the theory here is that these two skills would help to build up secure attachment. So mentalization is the ability to theorize the mental state of oneself and of other people, which includes thoughts, feelings, and explanations for other people's behavior. It also includes intentions. So to put it in a different way, it's really about looking at somebody and knowing what they're thinking and feeling. With psychodynamic theory, avoidant attachment and avoidant personality disorder have kind of an integrated relationship. The theory here is that avoidant attachment causes avoidant personality disorder. So avoidant attachment is caused when somebody feels rejected by parents or caregivers. This leads a person to be frightened to develop loving relationships as an adult. So with this theory, there's a clear path here to treating APD, right? Changing the attachment style. Now moving to this particular presentation example, again, details are of course changed and the name has changed. I'm going to use the name Liz. So Liz is in her 30s. She is single. She initially presents to a male therapist, again, a therapist using a psychodynamic modality. She initially presents to him with a complaint of having trouble adjusting to a new job, but the conversation quickly turns to focusing on childhood. Now, this isn't really a surprise, again, with a psychodynamic therapist. I'd be more surprised if the discussion did not move to somebody's childhood. Liz never met her father. She was raised by a single mother, and her mother used to tell her that her father was married to another woman and had children. And the mother also used to tell her that the father could be described as somebody who would do anything for anybody. Outside of that, Liz didn't really know a lot about her father. Every year on Liz's birthday, her mother would tell the story of Liz's birth. She would tell Liz that on the day that the mother came home from the hospital, the mother left Liz in the car and watched television and did this for quite a while until remembering to retrieve her from the car. So you combine these things and you really have Liz feeling guilty for existing. Her father would do anything for anybody, but not do anything for her. And to her mother, Liz was really an afterthought. Her mother maltreated her emotionally and physically. She demanded perfection from Liz. Sometimes when Liz was doing her homework, her mother would stand behind her, and each time Liz would make a mistake, she would hit her in the back with a baseball bat. Liz played softball, but her mother got involved in helping Liz practice, and she would make her practice for hours until she felt like she had techniques down perfectly, so eventually Liz quit playing softball. Her mother told her that if you can't do something right, you shouldn't do it at all. So really just, again, kind of a perfectionistic type attitude, and typically that would be, of course, really bad advice. The conditions in the residence where Liz and her mother lived made it almost uninhabitable. For years, they didn't have working plumbing, so often Liz would go to school wearing clothes that were not clean, and she was bullied as a result of that. Teachers investigated by asking her if there was anything wrong, but she would deny anything was wrong because Liz was worried that her mom would retaliate against her. In the summer between high school and college, Liz was looking forward to going to college to escape her mother, but Liz was involved in a fairly severe motor vehicle accident which derailed those plans. She spent several weeks in the hospital and took a year to fully recover. When the time finally came to go to college after this recovery, Liz went to community college instead. She rarely went to classes, she didn't do her homework, and eventually she failed. She moved in with a romantic partner. This relationship was emotionally distant. She worked in a job where she made minimum wage, and during this time she started writing. She used to write stories when she was a child, 
but she had not written for many years. This was a way for her to self-express, and it became kind of an important activity for her because it helped her move on to taking some other risks. She left the romantic partner, she went back to college, and she got a new job. She was doing okay, but she had to force herself to keep up with all her responsibilities, like she avoided doing the laundry, the dishes, and taking out the trash, and these different items would accumulate in her residence. Now, she was running out of money, so she advertised for a roommate, and she found one, but the roommate started yelling at her and punching her, and one of these assaults resulted in Liz having to go to the hospital. Liz said she never fought back because she felt like she deserved it. And even after this incident with her being hospitalized, the roommate still lived with her. It took three years for Liz to find a job after she graduated from college, not because she couldn't secure job offers, but because she was afraid to accept a job offer. She was afraid that it was really an important decision and she would make the wrong decision. Finally, when she did accept a job, she had to relocate for that job. And this gave her an excuse to get away from that roommate. In her new job, she found herself crying without any clear cause, she was procrastinating, and she was having trouble contending with invitations from her co-workers to attend social events. This is what really led to her seeking counseling. So she went into counseling and she was diagnosed with avoidant personality disorder. The psychodynamic conceptualization of this case was fairly straightforward. Paternal abandonment and maternal neglect. The basic needs for comfort and affection were not met. Taking risks always resulted in punishment, and we saw impossible demands for perfection. Liz learned to avoid thoughts, feelings, and social risks. We see with the course of treatment that Liz was in therapy weekly for more than two years. The clinician described her as cooperative, displaying appropriate humor, being pleasant, and relaxed. However, when discussing emotions, Liz would make poor eye contact and become restless. Early sessions focused on Liz's harsh self-criticism, indecisiveness, and the distance she was creating between herself and other people, so she was avoiding relationships. She gained some insight early in therapy. She realized that she didn't deserve being treated the way she was treated by her mother. Liz declared that she was cured by session 10. She was immune to her mother, and she'd gained power and control. She said everything was better. The clinician recommended that Liz continue treatment, at least for a few more sessions, and Liz didn't bring up the idea of termination again for over a year. At that time, she acknowledged that during session 10, she really should not have stopped therapy. It was good that she continued therapy, that she was really indicating everything was fine, but it wasn't. So again, we see kind of the gaining of insight, just even with that, even with realizing that she wanted out of therapy, but it was a good idea to stay in therapy. There was an interesting incident at session 35. Liz reported she completely forgave her mother, right? So her mother was completely forgiven. And the clinician challenged this claim, right? Which wouldn't be unusual for this far into therapy, for that relationship to be at that level. Liz, however, missed the next session, saying she forgot. This was the only appointment she ever missed in over two years. During the next session, Liz explained how she was frustrated, the clinician, for taking away her good feelings. The good feeling being that the attitude toward the mother had changed, right? She had forgiven the mother. The clinician charged Liz for that missed appointment, which is fairly common. And later, Liz described how this reenacted her experiences with her mother. The mother took something away from her and then punished her. So this is how she really saw the clinician. The clinician took away her good feelings and then punished her after that. The clinician pointed out that the mother would not have encouraged Liz to talk about the negative feelings. So there wasn't really a strong parallel between what happened to her in session 35 and what happened to her during her childhood. And after this, the therapeutic alliance improved, right? So the clinician was able to see the similarities and the differences between those two points in time and really point out the difference in a way that brought the two closer. So I thought this was a fairly good therapeutic technique, and really, I think, somewhat clever. By building trust in the clinician, Liz's avoidant attachment became more secure. She was able to learn what a healthy relationship felt like. 
she was able to operate from that position of safety, again, that therapeutic alliance, and take more chances when reflecting on the nature of other relationships and when thinking about what she should do in terms of perhaps being more approaching in those relationships. Liz finally realized that when other people had ill intentions toward her, it provided useful information about their character, but not about her character. So it would seem that initially, Liz thought of the clinician as the father who abandoned her. This is referred to in psychodynamic theory as transference. Right? That's when the client treats the clinician like somebody else important in the client's life. And transference is actually remarkably common. Here we see the clinician is able to reflect on these feelings. The clinician is able to use the transference to help Liz write a new narrative. A narrative where Liz is strong, confident, and worthy. Liz also learned how to lower the bar for herself, to hold herself to a lower standard, right? So this sounds like an unusual treatment goal, right? We usually don't think of counselors or other mental health clinicians as encouraging clients to lower their own standards, right? To lower the client's standards. But in this case, with the perfectionism influence on Liz, this particular tactic actually makes a lot of sense. Liz really did need to learn to lower the bar for herself, to not hold herself to an unrealistically high standard. So it's not about a low standard, it's about a realistic standard, right? So that's probably the best way to kind of interpret this technique, not that the clinician was saying, hey, look, you don't need to have any standards, right? That's not what he was doing. So as therapy approached the end, as it approached termination, we saw Liz started pursuing goals, going out with friends, she no longer procrastinated, and she even asked somebody out on a date, which she had never done before. So we can see in terms of the symptom criteria with avoidant personality disorder that the disorder appeared to be in remission. So what are my thoughts in terms of this particular case? Well, first, I thought this was really a very well-written article. I liked the way that the article kept relating and connecting avoidant personality disorder back to psychodynamic theory. Clearly, the client had a positive outcome and seemed to grow in a number of ways during the course of treatment. Now, what actually helped Liz to improve? Well, as I mentioned, I like the parallel between the theory and the disorder, but at the same time, it's easy to see what you want to see or what you expect to see. As the saying goes, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Now, this isn't just a problem with psychodynamic theory. This is a problem with any counseling modality. If we approach a case from one counseling modality, we frame the experiences of the client in terms of that particular theory, which is useful in many ways, but closes us off to other explanations about why the client improved or what was wrong in the first place. The short stories that are explained in this article, of course, occur inside of the larger story of Liz's treatment over those two years. And I wonder if there are any stories in there that didn't really seem to fit with psychodynamic theory. It would have been interesting to see if there were other interactions that maybe would have required some sort of explanation outside of that theory. So again, that's really overall, I think, a minor criticism. And a lot of these articles, a lot of these presentation examples do look at the case from just one angle. That's a very popular strategy with this. But again, I think it would have been okay just to take a look at some other stories that didn't seem to fit with psychodynamic theory and just offer some explanations about what could be going on there. So back to that question, what made the difference? Why did she improve? Well, it could have been the effectiveness of the psychodynamic treatment. It could have been the earned secure attachment. That was really the theory of this article, that that secure attachment was what corrected avoidant personality disorder. It's what helped the client to move past those symptoms. Now, the clinician in this article clearly seems to be competent and clever, so there's no doubt that that's a possibility. But it could also simply be the formation of a good therapeutic relationship. That could have explained why Liz was able to recover. And, of course, there could be a number of other possible explanations, including that she learned to think and behave in different ways, right? So, like, something more consistent with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, there's one other important point I want to make about this particular presentation example. I was happy to see an article that focused on avoidant personality disorder in this way. This disorder causes so much suffering, and it's actually quite prevalent in the population, but in terms of research, it's often overlooked for other personality disorders like borderline 
narcissistic and antisocial personality disorders. So avoidant personality disorder simply doesn't attract the same attention from clinicians or from researchers as do other personality disorders. So this presentation example and article, I think, really represented a step in the right direction. So I know whenever I talk about topics like avoidant personality disorder, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put those opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They're sure to generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this presentation example on avoidant personality disorder to be interesting. Thanks for watching.